Well, welcome. Welcome, guys. Welcome, everyone, to our fourth webinar. And today we have a super interesting topic. Uh, and we have amazing speakers, amazing participants. I'm super happy to see so many people of you, so many of you joining uh, and then continue joining. And today we're going to talk about performance, but from a perspective we've never touched before. And it's the performance that the user experiences on his or her journey to actually accomplish the business goal of the website. Um, having this in mind, uh, we worked in the last uh, almost one year uh, together with uh, the Google Chrome guys, and uh, we were able to test and um, measure quite a lot of uh, situations where the users are uh, actually uh, navigating to pages that are preloaded for them. And we use the so-called pre-render technique, uh, which is a pretty novel in the Chrome browser. And um, uh, out of this uh, technique, we're able to share at uh, this presentation, we will be super happy to share what we found and we'll be super happy to show you uh, exactly uh, what's the benefit of uh, your users and your websites to have uh, loading pages and to have instant uh, page load. Uh, without further ado, let me share with you the speakers. Uh, today with us, we have uh, Barry Pollard. Barry is a developer relations engineer at Google. We have Adam Silverstein. Uh, Adam is a developer engineer at, uh, relations engineer at Google with a strong WordPress focus. We have also Simon, who is uh, our uh, chief engineer at Nitro Pack. And uh, we have me, who will be uh, your host today. Uh, I'm uh, serving as a CEO and co-founder of uh, Nitro Pack. Okay, let's jump in on the topics. Uh, we have a pretty nice agenda. Initially, we'll be uh, touching, uh, uh, mostly Barry will touch the uh, actually how the instant future navigation look like and what's the benefit for the users. Uh, right after Barry, Adam, Adam will jump in to talk about uh, how the, these uh, navigations are actually uh, useful for WordPress and how they're going to be integrated. And right after Adam, uh, Simon will talk about uh, our initiative on the uh, navigation site as well, which is uh, called Navigation AI, where we are uh, actually uh, attempting to predict the next user uh, navigation so that we can pre render it in an efficient manner. At the end, we have some time for a discussion and uh, we'll have a Q&A session. So please feel free to shoot your questions anytime at the chat in this uh, webinar. All right, let's start. Uh, Barry, the stage is yours. Thank you, Jordi. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, today, we're going to primarily be talking of, about uh, uh, techniques you can to improve, use to improve this metric, um, LCP. LCP, or Largest Contentful Paint, is one of the three core web vitals metrics that Google introduced a couple of years ago to measure the user experience of your website. Uh, it measures from when a user clicks on a link until the largest content appears, which generally um, signifies that the page is mostly loaded at that point. We have a threshold of 2.5 seconds um, to get that LCP image, banner, a text, uh, whatever it is, loaded up onto the screen, which may seem like quite a lot of time, particularly whenever computers normally deal in milliseconds or even microseconds. 2.5 seconds sounds like quite a long time. But the truth is the LCP is the core web vital that sites still struggle the most to pass, even more so than the new IMP metric that we talked about previously in this metric, which is something we haven't optimized for uh, very much at all. LCP is even tougher than that. Less than two thirds of pages are path or of origin, sorry, uh, are passing LCP at the moment. And that's because there's an inherent slowness to browsing the web. Rather than most software where you download, install and use it locally, the web is, as the name suggests, made for, uh, uh, part of the internet. And um, as that suggests, means that there is a large network to connect across. It's a worldwide network. Every time you click on something, you're connecting to a server that may be on the other side of the world, asking for a page, getting it back, and then loading more uh, resources apart from that. And it's not even as simple as that. The reality is there's lots of little steps that you have to go through. If 
you're in a mobile network, you have to connect your mast, then you have to connect to various routers, then you have to go through all sorts of middle boxes and middleware to get to a server. The server then has to talk to a database server, get um, the details it needs to construct your page, and then send it all back. I mean, honestly, it's amazing that the web works at all, and that's really a testament to all the network engineers of the world, um, that it's as fast as it can seem. But when you put all that into perspective, 2.5 seconds suddenly it doesn't seem like a very long time at all. And that perhaps explains why sites do struggle with this metric. However, one of the ways that we're going to look about this is um, how we can uh, look at improving future navigations. And there's various browser APIs for that. As I said earlier, for traditional software, you take that hit up front, you download everything, you install the cool software package, and then you've got it all there going. And the web doesn't work with that, but maybe it could. And maybe you can use some of these techniques to actually get to that, some of that front loading going on. Uh, LibRel Prefetch is one of the easiest ways of doing this. Um, this is an API that you uh, trigger by adding uh, a link, a HTML tag to your page, and say, get this um, script um, uh, as a prefetch because I'm going to need it soon. Not necessarily for this page, but maybe for a future page. This is fetched as a low priority. Some of you may have heard of LinkRel Preload, which gets stuff ahead for this page that maybe is a little bit hidden from the, the, the browser initially. LinkRel Prefetch is reasonably well supported. All the Chrome-based browsers, so Chrome, Edge, Opera, um, support this, Firefox support this. Safari is a bit of an edge case. It's had support for this for a long time, but behind flag, like we're talking years. I'm not sure why they haven't quite enabled it there. So those users can't benefit from this. And it kind of acts like uh, the JavaScript Fetch API. Um, but kind of with a low priority. Many sites that use this often use the fetch as a, a kind of a fallback for the Safari users where it isn't supported. It fetches a resource, stores it in the HTTP cache, and then whenever a future page needs it, it's got it available and it doesn't have to make that long network trip that I was talking about. LinkRail pre-render was the next stage of this, and this was available in Chrome. Um, it's very similar to prefetch, but it's used for document and sub-resources. So you, again, put a link, um, the ref type is pre-render, and then you say what you want to get next or HTML. In the past, that originally pre-rendered the page. I'm going to talk a lot about what pre-rendering means today. But basically, it would fetch that page, then see all the JavaScript, then execute it, fetch all the other resources, kind of basically render that page and think of it as a background tab. And then whenever you clicked on it, it brought it forward and um, was available there for you instantly. Um, doesn't do that anymore. We find a number of problems with this thing that we've, uh, we're have we looking to solve, but we basically it was using a lot of memory, it was poorly specified, um, none of the other browsers supported, it looked like it was going to be difficult to get support, yes. So we actually changed this a number of years ago, and despite its name, LinkRel pre-render no longer does actually pre-render page. Instead, what it does is it downloads the static HTML, sees any resources in there, and gets those as well. So you can think of it as like a prefetch plus plus. It's getting a lot of extra stuff there, but it's not actually pre-rendering the full page. Um, and that's not something that's, uh, as I say, that's due to inherent things in it. So this API is deprecated and it's really not recommended to use. And I'm only bringing it up here um, for those of you who've heard of it and some of what we're gonna talk about next may seem familiar. So anyone's using this, and there isn't many sites using this because of the problems with it. Um, we recommend turning it off and looking at this next thing that we're talking about here. And this is going to form the main basis of what the webinar is about today. There's a new speculation rules API that's much better specified, and it's useful for prefetching or pre-rendering entire pages. It's a JSON-based API, so allows um, best fine. Um, there's much more advanced use cases that you can use it for, and we're going to see some of them uh, later on. Rather than link row prefetch and link row pre-render, which literally just have one um, link that you can put in there. This is currently Chromium only, but we're going through standardization at the moment. Um, and we're hopeful that uh, once it's standardized, other browsers may take an interest where they didn't before with pre-render. And speculation rules, and this is what I think is the really exciting bit about it, is it allows instant loading. So we can measure it in milliseconds, not seconds. And this isn't just me, the hyperbole, trying to say this is really the thing. We're actually going to see examples later from NitroPack where we've actually seen this happen. So if we can take that 2.5 seconds, I'm sure to say some sites are finding very tough to, to meet and bring that all the way back to two, 200 milliseconds or something like that, then that will be a huge improvement. And um, the speculation rules API, uh, as I say, it's just a JSON based API. Here we've got an example of prefetch on the left and pre-render on the right. Um, 
you insert this into your HTML, either in the initial HTML delivered from the server or added by JavaScript APIs. You specify the type, prefetch or pre-render, um, and then you can set the source. In this case, we're going to give a list of URLs. So next.html, next2.html. When the browser sees these, it will either trigger a background fetch uh, for these uh, resources, um, and you'll see them in your dev tools, or it will trigger that um, background tab pre-render um, uh, tool uh, process that I talked about before. Um, something brand new launched this week is um, an enhancement to the speculation rules, where instead of giving a source of, uh, of list and a list of URLs, we're giving this a source of document. Um, and what that says is get all the list of links that you might want to pre-render from the HTML document itself. Um, you can specify a sort of where clause to it. So here we're saying get the links, and we're saying anything where the href matches star or slash star. So get anything where we're, we're um, looking for links on this site. Um, and excludes a number of pages here, not safe to pre-render. Maybe that's slash logout or slash by or some pages that you don't want pre-rendered. Um, we then specify an eagerness, um, and we have three settings for this. Eager means click up, do it right away as the document loads, which is probably not to be used really for document rules. It's more useful for the link, the list rules. Moderate means that if you hover over the link, so if, you, if you're reading it and you're hovering over it, and after 200 milliseconds, if you're still hovering over it, there's a good chance that you're thinking about clicking that link, and it'll go ahead and prefetch or pre-render the page in the background. And then whenever you do click on it, it'll be instant. And conservative is, if you don't want to quite go as far as moderate, um, then uh, whenever you actually start clicking on it. So whenever you click on it, there's a mouse down event, then a mouse up event, and then a click event. And it's on the last one that the pages start to unload the page and then finally fetch the other page. Um, so even just doing that on the mouse down event can give you a, a little bit of a head start. Probably not enough to pre-render the whole page, but a bit of a head start that you'll get an improved LTP. Because there are trade-offs to prefetching and pre-rendering. Prefetching and pre-rendering means paying up front for future use. So you're downloading something that you hope the user is going to use. If they don't end up using it, then you kind of wasted their resources, your server bandwidth, um, their CPUs and their devices. At the same time, if you leave it too late until you have high confidence they're actually going to do it, say on that when they either start clicking, that leaves less time. So it's all about a balance of trying to figure out what when you what you can do to reduce the waste of efficiency, uh, waste efficiency. So this is where you get the right number of um, pre-renders to happen, so that you get a high uh, percentage that are, that are actually going to be used. If you pre-render every single link on the page, you're going to be able pretty reasonably confident that one of them is going to be used, but you've got a very terrible waste efficiency there. At the same time, if you only pre-render one link and you've no idea if the user is going to click that link or another link then you've got a great waste of efficiency, but your accuracy, um, the next metric, the friction accuracy, is very, very low. And then the third thing to consider about is your lead time. As I say, you can leave it to much later until people are hovering over the link, until they start clicking down on it, um, and you get a very, high, uh, very low uh, lead time, but high accuracy. And these three metrics can be considered. Um, the risk is in the first two. Are you over pre-rendering, over fetching, wasting resources, wasting time from your users? Wasting bandwidth, and then the other two, the last two, can also be considered to measure the reward. The more accurate you can get, and the more advanced you can get, the more you can cut off of that future navigation until, ideally, you click on it and boom, the page is there instantly. And you can think about these in type and length of graph. So, if we pre-render every link on the page load, um, which I say not to be advised, then you get terrible waste of uh, efficiency, great accuracy, and great lead time. Now. To stop you, um, because we believe this is so risky, in Chrome we actually limit the number of pre-renders to do that. So in the document rules, we limit it to pre-renders um, that will happen at once if you say do it eagerly. Um, and then we will uh, only pre-render more as we get more signals to do that. So this is a high risk, high reward strategy. Um, pre-rendering links on mouse down um, means that you have great waste efficiency. You pretty reasonably confident that people don't, they don't mouse down on a link and then move off and then mouse up. Some of us developers do that, but in general, users don't. Um, so yeah, you're, you're going to have great waste efficiency. You're going to accurately predict the link that they're actually clicking on. But your lead time is much, much smaller. So as I say, you probably won't get a chance to pre-render the full page. It will load slightly faster, but it won't be that instant navigation going on. 
So in general, this is a low risk, low reward strategy. Um, somewhere in the middle is that 200 millisecond strategy that I said, this moderate thing, where you're looking, people are going towards it, they're moving their mouse towards it, they cover the link. At that point, the browser can sit there and go ahead and get it. Not immediately, because people are moving the mouse all over the screen, but whenever they stop moving it over the screen, just before they click. Waste of efficiency, you're going to have some waste, and that might pre-render some pages that they're not going to use. You're going to get some a, a great accuracy, because it should, in theory, pre-render all the links. And you get a decent lead time. Not perfect, not a huge lead time, but not the previous one you get there. That's medium, medium reward. And I honestly think this is the best strategy for most websites, unless you have a lot of information about knowing about what your page is doing. Certain pages, you know, if you're in the middle of the course, you could pre-render the next um, step of the course because you've got reasonable assurances that people are going to go that. Um, but in general, whenever you have no idea where people are going to click, this strategy uh, um, really works quite well, in my mind. The ideal course is one where you can get um, fantastic waste efficiency, fantastic prediction accuracy, and a huge lead time. But that really means understanding your website and knowing exactly what people are going to use and where they're going to go. And that's where a tool like Nike Pack can possibly help. And I'll leave those guys to talk about that uh, in the next sentence. Okay, and so that's a bit of background going on there. Um, the Google Chrome team have a lot of docs on this. Um, the links there, the pack of our link will be shared afterwards. Um, and there is also a specification, so if you've got questions or answers about it, then do let it go. Um, so that was the boring stuff. I'm now going to move on to the more exciting actual implementation of actually seeing it. I'm going to hand over to Adam uh, to talk about what they're going, to, how they're thinking about using this in the WordPress community. Adam, thanks, Gary. That was, that was really informative, as always. I'm going to be just talking briefly about what we're doing in WordPress to try to enable the Speculation Rules API uh, and just pre-render pre, -render, pre uh, fetch in general. So, first of all, we have implemented uh, a module in the Performance Lab plugin, which is also available as a standalone plugin that implements the Speculation Rules API. And it's a kind of a basic implementation where we, we're using the conservative approach of, you know, when you click down, pre-rendering the page. I'm sorry, on Hover. On Hover, we're pre-rendering the page. And, of course, like everything WordPress, there's hooks in there so that developers can modify the behavior. The goal here is to basically enable testing. We'd like to merge something into core uh, along these lines, but we need people to be able to test it. So that's what this uh, performance lab plugin is about. Um, of course, we exclude WP admin routes by default because um, we don't want we don't want to like um, pre-render stuff that's in WP admin. This is a front-end implementation only. Um, and I guess a big challenge that that anytime you're implementing this uh, type of Prefetch or pre-render in WordPress is knowing what uh, routes to avoid or what routes to like prioritize, uh, and this is one thing we're definitely considering is how to add an API into WordPress for so that various plugins can indicate what they what routes they need excluded. So if you know if you have a uh, a plugin like a WooCommerce plugin, you want to exclude routes where people are going to be adding something to their cart or logging out, some user action that you don't want to pre-render. Or if you have maybe a, a CTA builder or a, a button builder that you know this is going to be a big uh, call to action, and you want to make sure that that route gets pre-rendered, a way to indicate that. So in the in the plugin, we already have a way, like you can add a, a no pre-render class to avoid pre-rendering, but we want a more formal API so that different plugins can kind of indicate what their uh, what needs to be excluded or what should be included to prioritize, um, and that will help plugins like Nitro Pack or any plugin that's implementing this to, to not have to maintain that list manually and kind of pay attention to all the various ways that people build and come to WordPress. Um, and then finally, we are looking at uh, ways to implement this in the back end. So if you can imagine if you go to the post list page, it's very likely the next page you're going to hit is the, the post editor, the block editor. So why not pre-render that? Uh, so users just get an instant load experience for that. Of course, on, on the admin side, there are some more challenges. We have to make sure we're not, uh, you know, uh, hitting links that, that are going to affect state. And then also, there's probably a little bit less benefit because people tend to have most of cash as they navigate around WP admin. But we're definitely looking at it, and it's something that gets brought up regularly in performance uh, discussions that, you know, we have to pay attention to how uh, our users of WordPress itself experience WordPress and the it should be performant as well as the front-end sites that we build. Um, so that's my little bit on how, what we're doing in WordPress. And with that, I will pass it back to Simon for uh, some stuff about what NitroPack is doing. 
Uh, great. So hello, everyone. And um, let's talk about Navigation AI. Navigation AI is actually a new product that we built at uh, NitroPack. And as the name NitroPack suggests, we care about speed. So it will be my pleasure today to tell you all about it. Let's start with a show video that showcases how Navigation AI works. There we go. We see a user who is browsing a website and the page loads within some time, in this case, 2.4 seconds. And now we have Navigation AI comes into play and it starts doing predictions. And we have already a page that is predicted, the user visits it and they see instant loading, zero seconds. They keep browsing, Oop, we've done another prediction and another one. And when the user clicks on this prediction, again, they see zero seconds loading time. So this brings great benefits to the users as we'll see in a minute. All right, back to the presentation. So we see that navigation AI is really great for user navigations. It provides users with much better experience throughout their journey on your website which naturally leads to happier users and users will be much less likely to leave as your page is loading because in most cases the page will load instantly. And as we'll see, this leads to some amazing improvements in the core of vitals. So how do we do it? If I can use a metaphor or an analogy, imagine that you're playing a game of darts and the rules are you have 10 seconds and five darts to score as many points as possible. So what would you do? Would you simply shoot all of the darts as soon as possible? Or would you take your time and risk going over time and not turn any points? As uh, Barry already mentioned, the truth is somewhere in the middle. You don't want to overwhelm the browser with too many predictions, but at the same time, you don't want to be too careful. So the way we solve this problem is by dividing the problem into two stages. So during the first stage, we use data enhanced with AI to do the initial prediction of the page load, but still we're not in a hurry to pass it over to the speculation rules API. Instead, we are watching the user interaction on the page. So user, user interaction could be maybe where they are currently on the page, have they scrolled somewhere or where their mouse is heading. And once we are certain that the user is about to visit the page, then we instruct the speculation rules API to pre-render the page or prefetch it in some cases. And sure enough, when the user clicks on the page, they see it load instantly because the page has already been painted in the background. And we measure our success by using these two metrics. They closely resemble what Barry showed us earlier. First of all, we measure our prediction precision. So we want this to be as high as possible. Prediction precision tells us out of the user, out of all of the user navigations, how many of them have we successfully predicted. So the higher the number, the better our success. Naturally, we also want to measure the waste. So the same way you don't want to have waste in your household, we don't want to create waste in your browser. So we want the waste to be as low as possible. And if the waste is high, then, then uh, this is something that uh, we should improve. So we're optimizing on waste as well. Of course, there are some cases where we can actually afford to have a bit more waste. For example, if you are on a in an office building with high speed internet or if you have a lot of resources in your browser then we can afford to uh, pre-render a few more pages and finally we created a metric we call browser honor ratio we sort of use this as a debug metric because we want to make sure that if we have given a page to the speculation rules api and the user clicks on it then this page is actually being prefetched or pre-rendered because uh, if it isn't, then this would indicate that uh, maybe we have overwhelmed the browser or maybe uh, the user is not on a really quick internet. So we should adapt to these situations. And that's how we measure success. And as more data uh, gets collected, our algorithm gets better and better. So let's move on to some real world results. And these results are taken from users who are currently in our early access program and they are already using navigation AI and getting the benefits from it. Here, it's worth noting that navigation AI is a separate product from NitroPack. 
but they both can work together and bring you even more benefits. So here on this chart, we see a comparison of pages that are loaded only with navigation AI. So these are either pre-rendered or prefetched pages versus pages that haven't been uh, optimized at all with navigation AI. And we see that the load time of the pages, the 75th percentile for every day is consistently below three seconds for everyone who has used navigation AI. And for pages that haven't been uh, predicted with navigation AI, the page load time is about six seconds. So to give you a feel, that's how three seconds feels like, which is an amazing improvement. Moving on to some other real world results, we see for LCP and CLS amazing improvements when we compare pre-rendered versus not pre-rendered pages. Basically, uh, when a page is not pre-rendered, the LCP is about 3.1 seconds in this case, but on pre-rendered pages, it drops to 0.4, 85% improvement. And with CLS, we see a drop from 0.3 to uh, 0.06, 80% improvement, amazing. And for prefetch pages, for those pages, only the page is being downloaded, but it's not painted in the background, but still we see great LCP improvements with about 52%. And just to mention about the going back to the CLS improvements, we, uh, we know that these are improving because a lot of CSS happens during the initial stages of the page rendering. And as this is being made in the background, the user doesn't get to experience any layout shifts. So when they click on the link, they see the already painted page. This is the power of pre-rendered pages. And when we see the Core Web Vitals improvements for LCP and CLS across all of the page views, we see that for this website, we have LCP pass rate improved with 15%, CLS pass rate improved with 8%, which is significant. And also we have time to first byte improvement with 26%, which is huge. So what happens next? Well, uh, currently we are in the early access and uh, the product is not yet available to everybody, but we are working on this. We are creating a user dashboard and we want to put this in your hands. We want you to play with it and we want you to reap the benefits of navigation AI. Currently we have 1200 sites that are in the early access program and they're already seeing the benefits. So welcome. And uh, you can join us by sending us an email on innovate at nitropack.com. With that, thank you for your attention and I hope to see you soon. George, back to you. Uh, all, all right. So I would like to open up here with a little bit of discussion and to talk uh, about what is waste and what is precision and why it's super important to actually uh, efficiently pre-render and uh, predict the next navigation. Um, so, Barry, uh, up to you, like why uh, it's important to have a high precision, low waste situation? Yeah, yeah as I say, um, the, there aren't unlimited resources in the world and every page um, load costs uh, people, um, it costs users time, many people are on metered connections, um, maybe on a mobile phone, you don't want to waste the bandwidth, um, you haven't actually clicked on that, so um, is it fair for the website to go ahead and, and load something in the background that you haven't asked for um, yet? Um, so, as I say, that's that's a, a, a decision that you need to take um, for your website and whether it makes sense and where it doesn't. I think we're all doing this for the right reasons, to try and make the experience better for the users. Um, we don't get anything for clicks that aren't actually happening. Um, we'll talk about the analytics there, I see some questions in the, in the chat room about that. Um, but yeah, so that, that, that's straight up, you've got to sit there and see um, how much cost are you willing to put onto your users for the potential benefit in the future. And again, the more accurate you can make it, the more that cost becomes worthwhile. If you're scattergun approaching pre-rendering every link, that's an awful lot of cost, very little accuracy, and maybe the user gains, maybe it doesn't. But also, that you're also creating a lot of congestion there, therefore, anyway. So if you try and pre-render 20 links, um, they're all going to have to download resources. They're all going to clash with each other. You've only got one network connection. Um, and the likelihood is that the one the user ends up clicking won't be pre-rendered anyway. So even if you could 
scattergun approach everywhere and, and use everything. It wouldn't be the, uh, the recommended uh, route to do it anyway. Um, so we really need to have a look there and sit down and see. And that's why we offer various options. As I say, you can give a list of URLs. You can use the document rules where we're, we're giving um, heuristics based on whether you're hovering, whether you're um, uh, touched down on a, uh, a mobile or whatever. Or you can try and use something more clever, which Nitropack is trying to use and try to use the AI to actually predict it um, to get higher accuracy, more complexity there, but higher accuracy um, and lower wastage. Uh, would it, um, to give a better results for both the user and saving their time and also giving a better chance of actually coming through and, and showing there. Right, and uh, also you can approach the problem from two sides. You can have uh, one approach that tries to you know, predict as much as possible, but at the same time you may have another approach that tries to avoid unnecessary predictions like the logout page. You don't want to <laughs> pre-render that because the user will be logged out or add to cart buttons that may be unwanted. So. Uh, or checkout pages. So these sensitive pages, you can safely just ignore them and uh, wait for an actual user interaction to uh, to have them. So that helps out as well. Yeah, and, and like, um, before people start worrying about that, I will uh, put in a couple of things. Um, the browser has certain protections in there. I mentioned earlier we limit the number of renders in there. We also only pre-render um, get links, so we won't ever submit a form, like a logout form or a buy form uh, or anything like that. So, um, in theory, if websites are designed properly, um, there shouldn't ever be any um, in, uh, negative interactions because um, developers should be using posts for these sorts of actions and, and or JavaScript APIs. The reality is developers don't always do what they're supposed to do. So there is opportunity there to say, hey, I know I shouldn't really be doing this, but this logout link is a link and it um, works in this way and maybe shouldn't, but you can you can put in uh, exceptions to to not process those and so on that. Um, or as the same, Adam gave another a good example, the WP admin link is probably not one that most users are going to need, even if it, even if it could pre-render it. Um, so yeah, there is some protection in there. So you don't need to worry about the browser doing this. But as I say, the more weird stuff that web developers do there, and we know there's lots of weird web developers out there, then there the are more opportunity for um, something strange like that happening. And I think also another interesting thing about the cost, so we get a lot of questions about that is, is this not very wasteful of doing that? And we should be thinking in a more green uh, uh, manner and, uh, and so on. And I think that's, that's a fair question. Um, the other thing is this isn't complete waste because what it does is uh, it, it, if prefetching it store in the HTTP cache, if you're pre-rendering, you're doing the same thing. In my mind, again, websites should be built to lazy load content and, and try not load you know, a 10 megabyte video as soon as you go there. So hopefully it's reasonably light to get there and get the, the document and maybe not fire everything off. There's also various APIs where you, as a website developer, you can sit there and say, hey, if I'm in pre-rendering status and I haven't actually been activated, don't run this JavaScript, don't do this, don't fire these analytics, which answers some of the questions that I've seen coming up there. So you can actually hold back some of your more expensive um, page load tasks um, until later. Um, so if you're a huge, big um, JavaScript framework app um, that runs there, maybe that doesn't, uh, that can either be excluded or maybe whenever it sees it's in pre-rendering stage, it goes, eh, I'll get some extra resources here, but I won't go for the whole page load that it would normally, with the, the meaning that that has to happen whenever the page, uh, the user actually clicks on it. But yeah, I, yeah. I, on the question of analytics, uh, I've noticed that uh, the Chrome user experience report doesn't collect uh, data for pages that users haven't experienced. So if the page has only been, uh, you know, pre-rendered in the background and users have never seen it, then no data will be collected by those pages. Uh, yeah, so for the Chrome user experience report, absolutely. We don't um, include those. We do include pre-render after they're activated. So uh, if you pre-render it in the background, you never click on it, it wouldn't be in the Chrome user experience for it. It won't show in your Google search console as, as, as your Chrome Vitals data, which will show in PageSpeed Insight. If you activate it, it will show in there, and you will get an LCP of 0.3 seconds or whatever you had in your slide earlier, which is fantastic and can help bring the overall average down. Um, it is, depending on your analytics provider, uh, they may or may not include it. Um, Google Analytics, for example, doesn't include it. It will wait until page activation. And similarly, um, the GTAG used for um, ad publishing doesn't activate until page uh, comes on there. This is fairly new. Um, so some analytics providers may still log that as a page view in the background because the whole JavaScript is executing. So again, if you're looking at this, we, we recommend wrapping those things in a 
it's basically an is has the page actually been activated um, wrapper that you can uh, call back that you can put in there. So typically for the more advanced use cases, it should be on that. The general people who are using um, some of the bigger providers like Google Analytics, um, absolutely, you shouldn't see that. And again, as this becomes more common and goes out there, we'd hope all the analytics providers would would eventually um, pivot to using it. And that includes ad providers and those sorts of things. Quite often, again, they're programmed not to show until it's at, they're actually on screen anyway. Right. As, as I'm aware, this uh, pre-rendering uh, speculation rules API is uh, currently like widely supported in Chrome and Chrome-based browsers. So what is your expectation on how soon it will come to other browsers, for, for example, Firefox or Safari? So I can't uh, talk to them because I don't work for those other browsers. Um, I think, I'd say, I think this is a much better chance than LinkRail pre-render. I think we've done an awful lot more job in uh, specifying it. We've sent out um, requests for positions from each of those browsers. We haven't got a, um, a firm yay or nay back from them, which isn't unusual. Um, quite often, um, unless the browser, you know, the browser's implemented, it usually has the, the most interest in, in this sort of thing. I think it also helps whenever um, people show um, the need and the want and the desire for this. So uh, partners like Metropack using it, um, developers like on this chat, if, if you um, see this, see the benefits, then that, that's a clear signal to the other browsers um, that, hey, this looks quite good. And as I say, we've done the best we can on our side with setting up specs and, and making it as easy to implement and saying, this is what Chrome does, not this is super secret sauce that Chrome does and we're not going to tell you what it is and you've got to guess and you might have a completely different implementation. We're doing this very much out in the open and saying, this is what we do, um, this is how we're using it. There are certain things that Chrome will do. So Chrome will pre-render certain things, like if you start typing a URL in the URL bar, www.goo, it goes, hey, this every time Barry typed that, he went to google.com or google.ie or whatever. And he's nearly finished typing that URL and 99% of the time he went there, I'm gonna go ahead and pre-render that in the back. But that I think is more specific to um, the browser. And I think that will depend on each browser doing it and lots of browsers have lots of these things. I think the page and developers actually using it or frameworks like uh, um, WordPress using it, that's the sort of thing that we really wanna be quite open and specified properly so that other browsers have the best chance of implementing it if they, if they so choose and go ahead and do that. That's great, guys. That's awesome. great, amazing discussion. Um, yeah. So I think it's time to move to the questions uh, because I see that we have just so many Lots questions. questions. <laughs> yeah. Let's the go. Audience. Okay. Uh, so I will pick just on a random basis uh, different questions and uh, uh, I'll just mix, mix them up. Okay. So let's start with James who asked the question of, is this a desktop only product? Probably James refers to navigation AI. Uh, no, it's not. We actually uh, work on mobile devices as well. Uh, Simon can tell a little bit more. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, even though mobile devices don't have a pointer, I assume that's the reason for the question. Uh, still, we have other signals, uh, for example, where the user is on the uh, position of the page. And uh, fortunately, mobile devices have a very small viewport. So this gives us very few uh, like uh, options to, to predict where they're about to, uh, to tap. And uh, we're also looking into other signals as well. So I hope this answers the question. And uh, maybe to answer it on the side of uh, Chrome, um, it is like supported in mobile. Barry? Yeah, I can say that. So I think, as I say, we get the basic one, the basic options, the list of URLs and some basic heuristics, the hover over um, or the mouse down. So the hover over doesn't work because there is no hover on, on most uh, mobile devices anyway. Um, the mouse down and touch down does give you a little bit of head start because people sit there and click and hold the click before they release it and, and do it, um, not as much. I think mobile is an interesting one. Um, because in some ways it's the one that can benefit the most because it's sometimes on a slower connection and so on, therefore pre-rendering would be great. In other ways, the so flip side to that counter argument is they're ones where people often have limited data plans. So maybe we shouldn't pre-render as much. So again, that's a, a, a challenge that you need to take into account. So maybe the fact that we can't pre-render as much on mobile isn't a bad thing. Um, but if you know again, or use a solution night pack that can, that can more accurately predict, not based on those heuristics. So um, based on analytics, 75% of users that go to 
bbcnews.com always click the headline link let's pre-render that or or whatever um you know if you've got another way of finding this out then then, then the tools are there to do that um but certainly yeah the hover your based heuristic one is obviously slightly limited there it will automatically fall back to the the, the touchdown uh, or touch start sorry event there so uh, you don't need to do anything different from mobile it just won't get as much of a head start great amazing um Oh, and sorry, one other, one other thing is we also put in other things if you've got data saver moves or we detect you're on a quite slow network, again, we won't pre-render in those cases because we don't want to waste your bandwidth for stuff you might not use. And this is already handled automatically in Chrome, so it's not something developers need to uh, think about when they're implementing the, uh, their, uh, so their other solutions for Speculation API. Correct. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so there are like a few questions that are touching on the analytics side, and uh, I think it would be nice just to comment. I'll just read one of them, and uh, that's it. Uh, does pre-rendering trigger analytic stats to show as a visitor? This comes from Marco. So as I mentioned earlier, it depends on your analytics provider. Um, Google Analytics is one of the most popular ones out there. Um, doesn't it's put a change in? I think last. October, I think from memory, um, where it will only register whenever the user actually clicks on it. Um, so it doesn't do that. You can, as a developer, if you're using a smaller provider that maybe doesn't, haven't implemented this, you can wrap that up and, and put a wrapper around it and don't call um, the whole provider unless you do it. Another interesting thing on this topic is you, this is how you probably want to measure it. So maybe while it's pre-rendering, you want to send a, an analytic back an event, say pre-rendering started. And then another one later saying activation actually happened because that's how you use to measure and say, hey, I'm over pre-rendering here. I'm pre-rendering a lot and 99 times they don't get used. Maybe I want to look at what um, process I'm using now and I'm just picking some old URLs that I don't even show on the page anymore. Um, so yes, the page has the ability to send the analytics back down there. Um, for most general uh, use cases that we previously used analytics for, you'd want to hold that off. And, and in a lot of the uh, ones, like Google Analytics, it will hold it off automatically. Um, we've also spoken a lot to run providers for people that measure core web cycles. And again, a lot of them will hold back until the pre-render actually happens there. Um, but I will stress and say that this is still fairly new. So particularly smaller analytic provider, we've got homegrown solution, then you may have to make changes there and then manually hold the back yourself. All right, all right, great. Um... One more question that we touched on it, but I just want to make sure that it's super clear to the audience. Uh, uh, Leo Farrell answer asks, uh, I want to ask if there are any performance drawbacks of overusing the speculation rules. So again, I touched on that earlier. I think um, the performance drawbacks are, um, well, waste. Uh, say on their bandwidth, their CPU, your server side costs. If every single user, in effect, loads two pages, your server side costs might double, um, depending how you, um, you're paid for those and that, that sort of thing. Um, those aren't performance rates. I think for the performance side, it's more about if your contention there. If you're still in the middle of your loading your page or you lazy load stuff and then you start scrolling down, but meanwhile, you're pre rendering 20 other pages in the background you only have that one network connection. So that's another reason to, to hold back and try and get a pinpoint more accurate and stuff like that. Because even though it's done with a lower priority and shouldn't really be interfering with the current page load, no page these days in the modern internet really just loads and is done. As you're scrolling down, other stuff's coming in, analytics beacons are firing, ads are loading, Twitter feeds are update, updating and so on. So pages nowadays are quite interactive and are continually talking. So I think we all have millions of tabs open in our browsers, I'm sure. So the browsers are very good at processing that, but at the same time, you don't want every single page to be in effect having 20 hidden browser tabs on top of that. Great. Yeah, just uh, as I said, Barry, uh, Chrome uh, also takes into account like if you've gone crazy and uh, you know uh, put a lot of pages into the speculation rules API, then it will hit a cap and say, okay, enough is enough. Uh, let's uh, let's not spend too much uh, resources. Sorry, Adam, I think you meant to say something. I, I was just going to say one other point of like resource contention that I would see for WordPress sites is just on the server side. If you're if you're on a low-powered server or a shared server where 
suddenly you're getting, you know, two or three times the amount of traffic to your server or your database. You could actually slow things down that way. Um, so that's just another risk, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Cool. All right. We have another question from John. Uh, John asked, how long are these render pages cached for? I'm assuming there will be control over this. Uh, there isn't actually control for the developer over this. Um, what happens is Chrome uh, keeps it in uh, cache um, for itself until you navigate away. So if you pre-render three pages and then you pick one, you go there, the other two are dropped. Um, now, as I say, what happens is they fall back into the HTTP cache. So if you end up going to one of those pages later, they'll still be faster because the resource is there. It might not be instant if they haven't pre-rendered, but it'll be a lot faster because um, everything will be there. Um, whenever it goes there. Similarly, if you close a the tab, they go away. If you um, uh, switch tabs, I think they stop pre-rendering, um, but then if you switch back, um, the finish off pre-rendering will be available for you there. Super. Great. Um, right. And then uh, there's a question coming from Alex. Uh, the question is, how heavy is the AI that is reviewing the user actions? And I well, the AI part is uh, actually running in our servers, so it's not executing in the browser in the JavaScript. Uh, so users, uh, like the, the JavaScript that is uh, running the navigation AI, uh, it's not. Uh, it's only using the, the ready-made results coming from our servers. It's not running the AI mod model itself. Okay, thanks. Um, one question coming from Ryan, uh, just to the Google Chrome team. Uh, can Chrome overrule my hint and not pre-render some of my pages? Absolutely, it can. Um, the key there is it's a hint. It's not a directive. It's not a command to do that. So we've already talked a couple of times about what do we do if you're in a low network, low bandwidth area. Uh, if you're low memory, if you're running out of memory, um, uh, then uh, if users have turned off, um, there's a flag in, in Chrome settings to say, I don't want to say I, I, I'm happy to pre-render and preload this sort of stuff, or I don't want to do any of that sort of stuff. I'm very um, conscious about using bandwidth or, or, or not loading stuff like that. So absolutely, Chrome can and will override and not pre-render your pages. You can't guarantee any of this. Cool. Nice. And there's another question coming from uh, Will Adams. And the question is, does this work for the first page load, such as home page or it only works for the navigation. That's a question. I'll take this one actually, if you yeah. don't mind. Yeah. So Go ahead. Um, I don't know about Nitrofax um, uh, particular product, so I'll let Simon talk about that. Um, in Chrome in general, um, until the page is loaded, you can't use any other sort of APIs expected to load. Um, however, I hinted at it earlier, um, the Chrome URL bar is um, starting to use uh, pre-rendering. So now, only whenever it has a high confidence that you're actually going to go there. So I give the example, I'm typing www.goo. Every time I've started typing that, I always end up going to Google. Um, also, Google search is looking at this. So um, it will, uh, we're going to see if we can pre-render there. Um, it uses a privacy con con conscious uh, technology called uh, privacy pro prefetch proxy, so we can't actually, uh, the other sites don't see that you're coming there, it comes from Google servers and it just try, tries to get it up and ready for you and do that. Um, so yes, there's ways that the browser can actually go help with this sort of thing, but as a site owner, no, you, can, you obviously can't do that until the site actually gets there. Um, however, as I say, a lot of people, if you go to the sites, um, you might view five, six, ten pages. So even if you can only get set ten, nine pages out of 10, because you don't get that first one, there is still quite a big opportunity to improve your overall core web vitals. I think Simon showed that earlier whenever he saw amazing results of pre-rendering, but in the um, overall website, slightly less impressive, but still a very noticeable improvement, but it's not quite the, the instant that you see for all your pages, because on average it's, it's not there. Sorry, Simon, I don't know if you want to expand on that. Uh, yeah, you actually nailed it. I was going to say the same thing about the Chrome browsers. Uh, as you're typing in the URL bar, it's, it's in some cases it starts, uh, uh, you know, loading the page in the background, uh, and uh, that's how it actually helps the navigation AI product work. Uh, because we don't do that, we need to have the first page loaded so that uh, the navigation AI JavaScript can do its magic. So navigation AI 
only uh, works after the first page load. So for you, you will see the benefits on the second, the third, the end page load. But on the first page load, we rely on help from the browser. Yeah, and I, I'd say th this is coming, this is happening. Um, and this is why we've been talking to ROM providers and, and warning them and analytics providers and saying this is going to happen whether web developers implement it or not um, because the browser is going to start using it. So we talked a lot about how you can exclude certain pages or logout pages and stuff like that. And I, I, there is de definitely cases where you wouldn't want to pre-render a page and there is exceptions to do that. They're generally not the ones that you would type into the URL. <laughs> Most people don't type in example.com slash logout, at least not frequently enough that they would trigger this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, if there is concerns of, oh, this sounds like could have negative impact and stuff like that, we're reasonably confident that it won't have because we are actually doing this a lot on the browser without you realizing it um, when it goes and, and people are benefiting and seeing that faster thing anywhere. So if there is any sort of hesitancy to do that, be aware that this is happening anyway uh, um, for a large portion of the users potentially. Great, great, cool guys. Uh, well, there are many other questions which are more related to how to get on board to uh, Navigation AI, how to join the early access program. Guys, you can just email innovate at nitropack.com and we're going to take care of uh, each and every website case. Um, regarding the, I think the questions, I think that's it. Uh, most of it, I think we covered all of the topics. There's one topic just uh, touches around the platform compatibility. I think which is pretty straightforward to answer. This is a JavaScript. Basically, it works in the browser and it doesn't matter like which platform is actually serving this JavaScript. Uh, so you can use it in Shopify, you can use it in BigCommerce, you can use it in any other platform. Um, yeah, that's mostly it. I think. Where um, can I, I'll just I just yeah. there was one last question there. Um, are you able to measure percentage by how many users are actually using Chrome compared to Safari, Edge, Firefox, Opera, and stuff like that? I think that's a, an interesting one. Um, one is this is in Chromium, so we just released it to Chrome, but we outsourced it to the Chromium source, which, as I say, feeds into Edge, feeds into Opera, feeds into Free, feeds into a number of these other browsers, um, Samsung Internet, and so on, so quite popular. Um, that's not to say that Safari and Firefox aren't popular in their own mind, but you, I would use your own analytics. It really does depend. But as a worldwide stat, I think Chrome is something like 80% of the browser market or something like that. Um, it's particularly like Safari is used quite a lot in um, sort of more well-off nations and stuff like that. But um, whenever you, you start leading uh, that into other areas of the world, Chrome has been, uh, got a, quite a high coverage there. So it's not 10% of the users or 20% of the users because it's not Chrome only, it's all the other Chromium based browsers. So it is quite a lot of people here. So although I love all the other browsers to support this and I hope they eventually will, um, you can impact a significant amount of your traffic uh, with this API. Yeah, that's great, that's great. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think we're good for today. Thank you so much, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, our uh, guests and our speakers. So thank you, Barry. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Simon, for joining. And thank you for the audience uh, for actually um, being active part of this uh, webinar, not just listening, but actually super, it, it, super high engagement, high energy. And like I uh, saw that uh, the chat is on fire. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was really, really a pleasure. And uh, let's make uh, a better web together.